code on this computer. That should now be. And uh, yeah, it, cool. It's mm, it, it we're takes gonna get work. Done. Okay. We're going to get that done. Sorry, Valeria. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Uh, no, just uh, it, it takes work, but uh, it uh, it it does work. If you put in the work, it does work. Uh, quick question: Can you tell us a little about yourselves? We will. <laughs> yeah. We we're going to get there. We're going to get there. So we'll get through the first couple of slides uh, and then we'll get to the bits where you learn about us and then we'll get straight into it. Because uh, we want to try and keep this to a nice tight hour if possible. And there's quite a lot to go through. So before we get started, now the thing is that everybody knows that always on these webinars, there's a point about 80%, 75%, 80% of the way through where people are going to like try and pitch something. So I thought we'll get that out of the way quickly and then we can just focus on the value. So there are discounts on Valerio's book start here, which is all about the, the, the key systems and processes that you need. And then we're throwing in my negotiation scripts and tactics uh, as well. Here's a little quick breakdown, Valerio, if you want to take this one. Yeah, so I wrote start here for uh, people in the collective uh, who uh, always had uh, similar questions about getting started. So I thought I would just kind of uh, address and eliminate all those concerns uh, with one book. And uh, it goes from the very beginning about uh, how to adjust your mindset uh, and establish yourself as a business. And then basically uh, guide you step by step about what you need from website to positioning uh, and plenty of exercises and examples and, and what I call them scripts, it's basically like how to use social selling uh, to connect with clients and um, score projects. And I've used uh, this exact same system to make tens of thousands of dollars uh, with minimal effort. And it only takes me 20 to 30 minutes a day to do this. So, yeah. Nice. Perfect. And so then... If you also want, you can get it in a bundle with Make Them Want You, which is something that I uh, put together. This is the kind of funnel and negotiation scripts that I use with my clients to go from charging very low project fees, like a couple of hundred bucks per project fee, up to a couple of thousand, up to sometimes five figures. Because basically, if you want to start charging high ticket prices, you have to get on the phone with people. Um, and this will run you through everything that you need to do to do that effectively and at scale so you're not playing like email tennis with people and so that you say the right things at the right time to make sure that you actually understand what it is that they need and whether you can help because as we'll cover later on in this a sales call isn't necessarily just to get the sale more than anything else you're trying to figure out whether there's a need that you can solve and then what the best thing to offer that person is in terms of helping them because that's what this is all about but anyway big discounts uh there's you can get start here for 20 bucks and if you buy that then it will be take you to another page where you can add make them want you for 49.99 this is the link down here which i will share later on if you want me to or i can drop it in the chat right now if you prefer in fact let me find that link drop that in and then we can get on to it quick. okay awesome. one sec copy so that'll take you direct to there you go the sure. um the checkout now let's get into the good stuff yes the good stuff what we're covering here today so here's for dawn who we are that's where we're going to start yeah. um the mindset because as i'm sure Valeria will agree mindset is super important it is the differentiator for a lot of people uh, if you get the mindset right everything else falls into place a lot easier positioning because that's what's going to help you stand out how to create the portfolio and then leading on from that into a good website. Um, the marketing plan to get you in front of the right clients, why you need to reach out directly. And like, you know, content marketing things are great, but they take a long time to actually see results. So direct outreach, if you want to see some quick results yeah. and uh, effective negotiation tips. So some tips from my experience of jumping on the phone with people. All right. So we'll get into it. Cool who we are, boom, over to you. All right, uh, I am Valerio Pugioni, and I'm half Italian, half Korean. Uh, many people 
assume I speak with an Italian accent, so I do like to kind of spook them with a strong Italian accent when I first get started. But uh, yeah, so I've helped uh, build several uh, startups, and uh, I got one of them, a Taiwanese research editing startup, to a million dollars in monthly revenue in less than two years. I'm also a former marketing director at another company, and if you've heard of Right Hook Digital Agency, which is a really popular uh, e-com agency, then, uh, well, Sorry. yeah, then yeah, I, I totally forgot who I am now. So sorry. Yeah, um, no, it's cool. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> yeah, um, I've been doing it for. Uh, long time freelancing on and off probably uh, about 10 years I've also held uh, remote positions at home uh, from home obviously but yeah I've negotiated dozens of uh, five-figure contracts and I've hired trained and coached dozens of successful freelance copywriters and yeah some of you here know me and I love seeing some of these names here and I will pass it off to Pete. All right, yeah. cool. So hopefully I can click through at the appropriate times now and not just keep speeding ahead. Sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm Pete uh, from the UK, originally from a small town in the Midlands called Coventry, um, now live in London. Been freelancer for about 10 years, uh, seven of them full time or around, I think I'm coming up to seven in like the next month um, as a full time freelancer. Grew my freelance business to six figures one time, did the whole digital nomad thing, had an eye injury, uh, which put me in hospital for a, a month, I think it was. And I, you know, was really light sensitive, couldn't work for basically six months. So I watched that business that I'd built collapse and then rebuilt it back up again, a second time to six figures again. In the past, I've worked primarily with SaaS companies. And that would be either just pre-funding so that we can improve their KPIs, you know, basically increase the lifetime value of customers um, while decreasing the costs so that they can get funding or come in just after funding to try and optimize those processes. Uh, clients that I've worked with have got over 25 million now in funding. That's led to me getting equity deals with some of those clients. So rather than just paying me to write content for them or copy for them, they bring me in, they give me a very small part of the business. And then I help them with growth. And then once I leave, I still retain that part of the business. Um, one such client, you know, we went from $3,000 a month to $220,000 a month within 18 months, just basically through two simple campaigns, um, which, you know, not for today, but if you're interested another time, just reach out and I can run you through how they worked. So that's us. Any questions from there? Or should we just get into the good stuff? Want the, you guys want the good stuff? I'm seeing no questions, so we'll just move swiftly on. Let's do Boom. The good, go, stuff. good stuff. Thank you. Ella. So, <laughs> mindset issues. <laughs> Bring on the goods. There we go. Thank you. Mindset issues, right? See, now I'm I'm not a huge fan of this thing because I was saying to Valeria the other day, John Boyle's my grandfather. Uh, <laughs> Um, but mindset is a huge thing for a lot of freelancers and a lot of the particularly newer freelancers that I work with have the wrong mindset when they approach potential clients and they are approaching potential clients really on what is a an employer employee basis they're just a remote employee basically they're not looking at this as in like I bring value it's like please tell me what to do and that is basically the employee mindset that you need to get away from. You're not there to be told what to do. You're, you want to become the expert who comes in, gives advice and is trusted with that advice, which basically means that you're coming in on equal footing with the potential client. Valerio, anything to add? Yeah, that's good. So, um, yeah, when you, uh, you also need to, um, I, I see so many freelancers asking the wrong questions, like uh, how do I get my profile approved on Upwork is the single most rage-worthy question of all time. Um, first off, what are you doing on Upwork, uh, right? That's, uh, <laughs> yeah. 
So, and another thing is, uh, so the difference in mindset, when I first started, I think I was charging something like 20 or $25 an ad. And then someone, basically someone at a big company was talking to me about uh, writing uh, an ebook for them. And I was like, okay, um, how much should I be charging? And I was thinking, you know, like, maybe like a thousand dollars and then they they said they threw out five figures so i was like oh holy you know like holy shit this is uh this is interesting so i decided why don't i throw back something else and say how about this you know how about we add another two thousand dollars for this stuff and i'll take care of the images as well and they were like all right let's do it and i realized the only real difference was in the mindset and being confident enough to call out what I thought I could get. Yeah, yeah. yeah completely agree. And so you know, we go into a little more detail because as you said, you know, when you started out, you were doing like 20, $25 ads. My first job was doing corporate bios for 20 bucks. It's 20 or 25. I can't remember. It's the same price really. And I got yeah. given five of them to write. And I was so grateful and I did five and I got paid for two or three. They were like, these are so bad. Um, that, that, um, yeah, that, that actually uh, uh, brings me to this. Uh, I, was, I was in another uh, Facebook group. It was a coaching group for uh, a freelance uh, business owners, basically, which we all are. We're all business owners. And um, to give you a little perspective on pricing, this this writer was at a uh, conference and one of the um, business owners was on stage and he was bragging about how he could find affordable writers at two dollars a word so you <laughs> that's perspective right it's like holy shit. yeah <laughs> you know and most people are out there charging like five cents per word and this guy's like affordable writers at two dollars yeah, exactly. And yeah, that's not even, I charge way more for editing than five cents a word. Right. So yeah. 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 But you know, that's the thing. And it's, um, everybody's always focused on that financial side of it. Like I need to make money. I need to make money, but you're not going to walk into a company as the CEO, right? You kind of need to pay dues and work your way up. However, that doesn't mean that you should ever work for free. If somebody says to you, if a company ever says, Oh, this will be great exposure for you. That, if a company says that, it's not true. The companies who offer great exposure never have to say it. You know who they are. Um, and, but, and they'll pay you. Yeah, yeah they'll pay they you for the exposure. Pay you. But then, <laughs> yeah, they will. But then there are instances where working for free in terms of finances can be a good move. So things like guest posting and things like this. You often don't get paid for these, but there are other benefits which lead to financial compensation down the road. So I would never say like, if anybody says, oh, you know, work for me for free, say no. You have to build something in to that agreement that will then result in payment later on. So when I was working on building out a new service, I did, not for free, I did a reduced rate for my first client. And I said, if you like this though, you one, have to sign me for three months afterwards on this agreement. So I knew that taking a hit on that front end was going to result in more money on the back end. And what I've done with some other people in the past is take a hit on that front end and say, but if you are going to get this deal and you like what I do for you, then you have to refer two other people to me later on. Um, payment doesn't have to be monetary, but it always has to tie back to a financial goal in the long run. Yeah. Um, to add to that. Yeah. So if, there's only one uh, there's only one instance I would say it's okay to work for free and that's if you're working for yourself uh, yes. if you're writing uh, spec ads uh, that's when you should work for free right like <laughs> yeah. uh, you you want to write all the um, I mean we'll get to writing specs later right yeah there, there's some stuff I'm writing specs later so yeah okay yeah cool but uh, yeah if don't don't work for free that's no, don't do it. <laughs> So we wanted to quickly sum up the difference in between like the freelancer mindset because the freelancer mindset is often you're a remote employee. People are just looking for somebody to tell them what to do and to pay them for what is it in effect their time. Um, 
you know, how many words they can do in an hour and yeah, the business and, owner mindset. Yeah. And if you act like a, a support, pe people will treat you like support. If yeah. you, yeah, if you act like you know what you're talking about and you take the lead and you can give good advice, uh, then you've really got their attention. Yeah. You know, and the thing that I always like to remind my students is if they knew what they were doing and if they were experts in this, they wouldn't have to hire somebody in to help them. So you need to remember that you're coming in as potentially a trusted advice giver. So you need to come at them as a partnership. So these are the different areas I see, you know, people make mistakes. And so freelancer, the business model is, you know, you work for others. You basically do what they want you to do. Business owners work for themselves. They work to grow their own business and they have clients and customers but it's all about what's going to help your business grow rather than I just need to do what this other person tells me. Uh, freelancers focus on the deliverable and it's like, is this headline perfectly optimized? How many words are in this thing? Whereas a business owner will only focus on the value because at the end of the day, even as a content writer, you're not really being paid for the number of words on the pages. You're being paid for the effect that those words on a page have for the client's business. Um, freelancers sell services, business owners sell products or productized services. And it's much easier to sell a productized service and to scale that up than it is to just be like, I'll write words for you. You tell me what you want them on. If you come at them and you say, I do this, this is how it works. This is how much it costs, much easier. Client relationship, as we said, is employer employee, business owner, it's a partnership. You come at them on the same level. You are there in a partnership with them not to be told what to do. The goal of a freelancer is to have freedom. The goal of a business owner is to scale and build wealth. And there's nothing wrong with either of those goals. Um, you just need to be clear on what it is that you want to do. And obviously the business owner approach is far more profitable. Yeah. And of course, if you're a business owner, it's far easier to also attain that freedom because a freelancer, I would argue is never, truly free because they do need to do yeah work <laughs> they have they have i guess it would be like a, a shorter term freedom i guess because you can pick up your laptop and you can go travel and you can do all of this but as you said they've always got to keep that everything moving and it's everything's very tied to their time so if you're not yeah. working you're not earning whereas a business owner can build things out so that revenue and income is not linked one to one to their time yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. C coming back to uh, um, the deliverable, I would also add that. Um, I, I mean, it, it just comes to like any anyone can be a content writer or a copywriter, right? Like, what? But what does that mean when when a business owner hires you? It really sucks when they sort of look at you as just a writer that they're paying and saying, Hey, go write this blog post or whatever. Um, and then they'll just edit the shit out of it. And it's just not what you wrote, which, yeah. which means they have no respect for you. Right? Like if, if they have respect for you and your work, what you deliver will be what they want and they'll pay you, uh, a project fee for it too. And yeah, I mean, we can come back to pricing later on, but yeah. yeah. No, I agree. It's, it's, you got to focus on that value that you provide. Um, words on a page is a commoditized element and there's always somebody out there who will sell the same number of words for cheaper, but if you sell it on value, then you can charge higher fees. Yeah. Cool. So, Small actions are, get small results. And this is another thing that I see so many people do. And they agonize over whether this tiny tweak is the right thing to do, whether to just do that minuscule shift and whether that's going to be the right thing to do. And it will be something like their headline on their website. Like how do they refer to themselves? And let's face it, if you're getting say a hundred visitors a month to your website and is using the word freelance copywriter or just copywriter going to make a huge difference in the amount of money that you make. No, you need to have like a huge action, a big domino that you can tip right there to get more visitors to your site, to get, you know, more clients in the door. 
it's not about focusing on those small actions. It's about focusing on the big things that are going to have the biggest impact on your business. Yeah. And um, many, many people seem to just publish their website and forget it, but visitors aren't going to find you. So you do need to be really aggressive with connecting and networking so that all these people do come see your website and your website should do the job of getting them to want to work with you. Yeah. yeah. Which is brings us on to that next point now, like aggression is a good thing. Um, you have to be very aggressive in that self promotion. Uh, this isn't field of dreams. And you know, if you build it, it doesn't mean that people are just going to turn up, you know, you've got to get out there and you've got to start on social. You've got to find that promotional channel that's going to work best for you and just hit that thing every day. You've got to be aggressive with that promotion. And, 90% of the time, whatever you try will fail, but that's okay. That's normal. That's to be expected. Um, personally, I think a lot of the success that I've had in this is not really figuring out what works, but figuring out what doesn't work and stop doing that and then start doing the little things where I see those marginal increases. Do those more and more. You finally get to that point that you want to be at. Good news is you can take advantage of our failures today because <laughs> we're going to run you through what we, what we found has worked. Yeah. And um, uh, another thing is that uh, uh, you got to love sales or at least, you know, just come to grips with or, or get comfortable with uh, having these sales conversations because they can be really fun and uh, they can get exciting and just become a good jam session. Half the sales calls I hop on with are just like chatting about marketing and content and then things just happen yeah no I agree like you know and later on we'll be going through sales calls and we call them sales calls because you know the, the objective is to get a sale but it never really is to be like a hard salesman you're not trying to be like the uh the used car salesman type thing it's not it's not the way to do it um positioning so this is one of those terms that a lot of people throw around but it's kind of uh difficult to explain for a lot of people it's, it's you know a lot of people give these explanations and you you're still left sitting there afterwards going what the fuck are they talking about i have no clue i i have a really simple definition it's basically uh managing how your ideal clients perceive you so it's just yeah. managing expectations and perception so that's pretty much what we've got here how your ideal customers talk about you when you're not around so she or he is the da 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 provider um, and I'm sure that you know people in our industry who are like, you know, big name writers and things. And if I would say, ah, oh, what do you know them for? You'd be like, oh, she's the email copywriter for e-commerce. You know, that's the kind of thing that you're looking for. Like to simplify it right down, it's, it's what are you going to be known for? And nobody's ever known as being, they're the generalist who can do everything kind of okay. Yeah. Yeah. No one's going to say, hey, uh, can you recommend a generalist off the top of your head? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and, you know, it's that thing everybody was like oh if you go into the doctor do you want the specialist for that issue that you have or do you want the guy who's like eh, you know I dabble <laughs> you I know. do a little bit of brain surgery <laughs> yeah. Yeah. a little bit of brain surgery when I'm not playing golf to yeah. be <laughs> honest that's probably most brain surgeons though yeah. <laughs> yeah. but then so then we, we put together this little rundown of exactly how to figure out what is your positioning um thing to mention with this is it's the same as your niche, right? You don't have to get it perfect. The niche and the positioning that you're going to land on today, this week, this month is not the thing that you're going to be doing until the day that you retire. It just doesn't work like that. Your interests change. Um, like I'm moving away from doing a lot of SAS writing now because I just feel a bit burnt out from it and I just need a bit of a shift. Um, the thing that you do, you're only looking for something that's good enough for now for you to see some traction and to get some, level of success and then you can make a better judgment about whether that's something you want to continue in or maybe you need to change or whether you need to like diversify what you're trying to do yeah i'm uh, i'm also um, trying to move away from sass i'm just yeah it's all those illustrations you know all those wavy illustrations they drive me crazy it's um, the same. I don't know who came up with those templates for that design, but they must be making a killing off selling those. Like, it, it, they remind images. me of the, what? What is it? The Blue Men and the Beatles movie. 
the yeah. cartoon, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's <laughs> freaky. But um, yeah. really, so here's a quick way to sort of get a starting point for your positioning. Um, well, you need it, it gives you direction and it helps you stand out. As we said, you know, when you know who it is that you want to be working with, you know who to target with your outreach. And eventually it will be a lot faster for you to be build a name for yourself in that area. So an example, if you were looking for a software as a service case study writer, would you go with the person who's just a general content marketer, um, just a freelance copywriter, a B2B case study writer, the content writer or the freelance copywriter? I mean, immediately, if I'm searching specifically for a case study writer, this is the first person I'm going to check out is the case study writer, right? It just makes it so much easier for you to stand out to people who need your service. How to invite, how to identify your position. Sorry, mate. Yeah. Oh yeah. I was just going to say that's especially important on LinkedIn because LinkedIn's yeah. uh, uh, search engine is uh, optimized like crazy. Yeah, it really is. Um, quick way to identify your positioning. If I was to ask you, what is it that you do? And let's say that you write sales pages, right? So that's a start, but then you want to go to the next level. Who is it that you do it for? Oh, I write sales pages for software as a service companies. Okay, that's better. You know, that's already gone from being this huge number of potential clients to a very focused service and potential client to target. What makes you different? Oh, you know, I'm the former vice president of growth for a SaaS brand. Now I write sales pages for software as a service companies. Again, you got a qualifier in there. Uh, I, I would like to add, you don't have to be the VP of growth for uh, anything to yeah. uh, position yourself. Uh, you could just even have a, a background uh, teaching for like 10 years so you can position yourself as uh, someone who has experience teaching uh, complex subjects to a, a, an audience of I don't know. It's it's like simple enough for children to understand, right? So you yeah. can really simplify things. There was a thing that I read a couple of years ago, and I still maintain that this is the most confidence boosting thing that I've ever heard. And it was um, Brian Clark, I think, of Copy Blogger, and he said, "To be considered an expert, all you need to do is read two books on a topic, because that will teach you more than like ninety percent of the general population." So Valerius, right? When you say like I'm a former VP of growth, it doesn't have to be that sort of level. Of experience you could be you know you could have had a hobby for the last three years that will put you above 90 percent of the population and put you in a position to write about it with some level of authority um doesn't have to be yeah. professional experience doesn't have to be super long time yeah it can be your hobbies you can also um position uh, not by industry or specialization but even by uh, an abstract concept like simplifying complex ideas right yeah. yeah yeah there's some guys out there who've grown great businesses off uh, simplifying complex images into like very or complex ideas into super simple images yeah yeah so like that you know you can communicate that value like super quickly um so yeah why should your clients care? So what's, what are they going to get from this? Because at the end of the day, that's what they really want. Um, so, you know, we've just tapped on the end here. VP of growth for a SaaS brand, write sales pages, software as a service company. So we're talking an average 27% lift in conversions. That last bit there, that's what people want for their business. Um, yeah. So, you know, go through those questions. Yeah. Sorry, what is it you do? Who do you do it for? Yeah. What makes you different? Why should your clients care? Yeah, but uh, you don't you don't have to uh, promise results ever. Like, no. even if you got results for somebody else, you can just say, "I got these results for this business. I can try to replicate them for you." But also, you don't have to promise re or or even mention results if you don't have them. You could just mention like years of experience or number of clients you've worked with. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, I will say as well, it's you can never actually promise results, which is why in this one it's like that resulted in average twenty percent in conversions. You can never say I will make you X amount of money in this time because that is it's just impossible. <laughs> you you can't you can't see the future. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, with this sort of positioning statement, a few tips. Keep it simple, like so simple that a child could understand it. Um, don't think that you have to use all of those wonderful buzzwords and everything because they don't impress anybody. Make it appealing to the client, 
focus on the return that they'll get. Um, again, it doesn't have to be a promise, but you know, what is it that it's going to work on improving for the client? Uh, and then come up with something basic, try and sell it. If nobody's buying it, go back a few steps and reevaluate. So I, I keep seeing this, um, when you mentioned the, um, don't use buzzwords, I keep seeing this ad from a copywriter and it's like, get conversion optimized copy on demand and it drives me crazy to see it because i'm like what is conversion optimized copy like i'm just like isn't it just supposed to be <laughs> that's what it's all good copy yeah, is supposed like, to be that's like yeah, selling something that's par for the course you know <laughs> yeah if, oh, buy a car yeah, that just, drives um, can you speak english yeah yeah, you just yeah. come down to the basic thing. And I see Hinley said that that's what he struggles with most. Hinley, the advice I'd have to you is just basically come up with something that works for you. Try and sell it. If nobody's buying, go back a few steps and try again. Um, yes. Exactly. exactly. Tom's got that right point there. By definition, copy is conversion optimized yet. Um, what about yeah. the results, Hinley? That was with the results. Oh, yeah. 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 He struggles with uh, promising results. Yeah. I guess. Just feels hard to talk about ROI and not promising results. You, uh, yeah, you don't have to assign yeah. a hard number to those results. You can, uh, you can say, I got these results for these other businesses, but no one can promise to get your results. If anyone promises you, your results you should actually be careful i mean yeah. you could warn your prospects i have because uh anyone who promises results is uh, agencies do it and people get disappointed all the time yeah the, yeah when when i was working at an agency and um the sales team was not communicating with the marketing department so we got the head of sales to promise seven X with ROI, right? Jesus. And you can't do that at volume at scale. So we were trying to scale um, million dollar businesses at seven X. <laughs> <laughs> it's impossible. Yeah. Did they do the, the extra annoying step and assign like a hard time frame? So we'll seven X your ROI in two weeks. <laughs> You know. Well, we had to have the regular client calls and we had to explain why the sales team promised one thing and we weren't delivering. <laughs> Tom's made a good point. He asks um, mm. buyers what ROI they expect. The keyword is expect they invest according to their expectation. It's a very it's good point. Um, yeah. But yeah, you can't promise like a hard number and say like, oh, I'm going to get you exactly 2,700 leads by the end of this month or something if you got that for a former per, for like a former client you can say look i did this with this other person and this is the results that we got i would expect something similar but i can't promise anything you can never promise it it's too many variables that you can't control too many. yeah yeah um, um also uh if you have if you did get that kind of result for someone that pete's talking about put it on a case study yeah yeah 100 percent uh, makes it so much easier as well when somebody's like, oh, so what exactly is this going to do for my business? You just go, read this. Um, read or if it's a video, watch this. <laughs> um, but yeah, positioning. Come up with something that works for the time being. Try and sell it, see what happens. If it's working, keep doing it. If it's not, go back and, you know, try again. You're looking for that initial validation to, to put more time and effort in. Creating a high-value portfolio to persuade clients you're worth the dollars, which is exactly what, Valeria was just talking about, you know, case studies and things to prove what you've done in the past so that people are like, oh, this person knows what they're talking about. Um, you've got to have a portfolio. Um, it's, there's, yeah, no ifs, ands, or no, buts about it. No two ways about it. Yeah. Same with the website. You got to have yeah. a website. Yeah. yeah. Um, why do you need the portfolio? to prove the client you're worth their time and dollars, to build trust, to remove any last minute objections and to showcase yourself. Because basically if you're going to these people and you're saying, you know, I'm this rock star, a level copywriter or whatever, and I'm going to 
help improve your blog in a thousand ways and they go, oh, great, um, can you prove it? If you don't have the portfolio that says, yeah, look, I've done it for these 10 clients in the past, why on earth would they believe you? I could make the claim right now that I will make you a millionaire by next week. There's, there's no way that you're going to believe me. But if I had yeah. 20 people I've done it for, then you might. Uh, it, it, even with the writing, right? Like if, if you're not showing off your writing style, yeah. how are people going to know that you can actually write? Uh, and write the way they want to. If you have a portfolio up and they can find it and they find that your writing style is exactly what they're looking for, then they are going to want to work with you. If you don't have a portfolio, you're making it kind of difficult for them to find out if they want to work with you or not. And they'll obviously go with someone who makes it easy for them than for someone who makes it difficult. Yeah, agreed. So James Brown, which is the best name in the world. Yeah, I love um, that name. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, just don't know, do you think it's possible to grow your business from successful with one client? I've been offered quite a big deal with an international client, but they will be my first and effectively only part of my portfolio. Um, so so it's, go for it. Go, go, go. Gonna, go. Oh, uh, well, I don't like to put more than... 80% of my uh, income on a, on a single client. So I, I do like to have at least five clients I'm working with at one time just to, uh, you can start out with that, but um, I would suggest looking for more clients in the meantime as well, because if that one client, uh, if anything should happen with that one client, you don't want to be you know, just in trouble, right? Yeah, yeah. I agree completely because there's so many things that can happen outside of your control. I mean, you look at this pandemic and how it's affected so many industries. If that was your only client and they went out of business through something which is completely not within your control, you're screwed. You've then yeah. got to, you know, hit the ground like hard trying to find some new clients. Um, if it's your first client, then... I, if I were you, I would focus on doing a very good job for them and then turning them into a case study for your portfolio so that you could then say to the next one, look what I've done for this. You know, As you said, it's an international big time client. That will work well to get the next one in. Um, yeah. Also, if they're really that pleased with your work that you're going to write a case study, try to get a video testimonial from them. Yeah, very much so. That's the, uh, the new A game with uh, case studies and testimonials is video. Angela's also asked in the Q&A, how do you create a portfolio if you have highly confidential clients that cannot give you a recommendation or if your work is from many years past? The work from many years past can still be used in a portfolio. Um, it, you did the work. It's rightfully yours to use in your portfolio. Uh, with the confidential clients, I would do one of two things. You can either anonymize anything so it's not, you know, uh, working in this industry, I achieved these kind of results for a client of this size or something. Um, or you could work with that client to get something put through with their marketing team that they're happy with to a level that mentions them. Uh, yeah, and you can also write um, spec pieces. Yeah. They don't have to be, um, they don't have to be for real clients. Uh, that's because uh, let me give you an example. It's the most common example I give. Uh, say you love uh, Chupa Chups, right? I, I love Chupa Chups. So I actually uh, loved one of Chupa Chups ad campaigns. And when I first started, I wrote a bunch of spec ads for Chupa Chups. And no one, came, no one from Chupa Chups came to me saying, can you take these ads down? We're going to sue you. And no prospect ever came to me and said I really loved your fake samples with Chupa Chups but we can't work with you because you didn't really work with Chupa Chups. They don't really care if I really worked with Chupa Chups they just want to know that I can write that way and that's uh, really all you need to do Angela just write the copy or content that you want to write and that you think your ideal clients would love and then just go from there. 
which is a brilliant segue into what's we need in your portfolio relevant samples there's no point in like hitting up somebody who needs an email copywriter with blog content samples because yeah. they're going to go like well you can write well but this isn't the kind of writing that we need so good luck the samples in your portfolio whether they're spec whether they're real they have to be relevant to the kind of clients that you're pitching um you also need to include what it is that you do so that somebody knows immediately contact details social proof testimonials pricing next steps for client pricing is optional it's if you know it's better to put it on the website but it depends on how you work things in that entire funnel um i still uh, have yeah, if, sorry uh, go on sorry it's, it's okay just finish up <laughs> i was gonna say I, I still have like a super simple google document portfolio that i just sent to clients and it's got everything that they'd need to know on there um, oh that's if cool. they're like so you, yeah they're like have you got samples and i'm like yeah here and it's got basically what i am clients that i've done big wins and then like a filterable table so if they want like oh, i want to see email copy or sales page copy they can just filter that by that and then click on a button and it brings up the actual asset Oh, I, I was thinking about messing around with a pricing calculator, but um, uh, what I did was I I did put a disqualifier there, basically saying, you know, this is the minimum or like, yeah. uh, but you can also add it as a form, just like budget range as a drop down menu and be like 1,000 to 2,000, yeah. 2,000 to 5,000, yeah. That's the thing with pricing. Um, I don't believe in that thing like, oh, every client's different and every quote is different. It's true to an extent, but there should at least be a range. Yeah. Um, does this go for landing page as well? I have a designer who can help me out, but all I can do is make it as a PDF or Google Doc. Most potential clients want to see live landing page. Oh, so it should work as a Google Doc. It can also work as a screenshot, like uh, just... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, save the page as a PDF. Uh, there's, I use, um, what's that? A Nimbus screenshot extension. Oh, okay. It's a Google yeah, Chrome yeah. extension. Yeah. I use something else. I use GoFull page. I just had to look oh. at the name of it there. But like, I had um, three or four advertorials go live last week. What day were we yeah, Today's Monday, right? So last week they went live. Yeah. And um, I wanted to add them to my portfolio. So I just quickly took a picture, like a full page picture of it. And yeah, it captures the page as Dawn says. And I've just added those yeah. to my portfolio because those pages might be live for say six months, but eventually they'll fatigue and they won't start, they won't keep generating results. So we'll need to update them and it might not be me. Yeah. So you can't always link to a live landing page. Uh, what, what would be uh, awesome is uh, to include a little uh, box to give context to the yeah. reader. Uh, May, you know, if you could include like goals or like results or like anything about what they wanted and what you delivered, uh, just it's good to see context. Yeah. Basically, you want to make it as easy and as simple as possible for the clients to understand why this is yeah, such a big deal. Um, make it super simple. It goes back to what we were saying earlier. You want to make it so simple a child could understand it. Yeah. Um, what if yeah, you don't want to give? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go. On. Go, go, go. You don't uh, want to give. <laughs> you don't want to give your prospects any extra work. Basically, it's the principle of great uh, UX and CRO is um, yeah. don't make me think, right? Don't make your prospects think. They just want to yeah. click and, oh, this is the guy. Screw it. Yeah. Or this is the girl. Screw it. Let's go. Yeah. Right? So then what if you don't have any uh, samples, if you're brand new? As Valeria has been talking about, you, you create spec samples. Um, so quick breakdown on how you can do those spec pieces. So let's say that you want to do sales pages for software as a service, find pages that, that exist, analyze why they work and create your own sample either for a real brand, or you can make up a brand just to demonstrate your approach and your style of doing this. Um, what to look for, look for how, what they focus on in that piece of writing, the structure, the language that they use, the tone of voice and the layout. And you want to try and mimic all of these things in your one but obviously put your own spin on it um so for example here's one from an old client of mine so if i was analyzing this i'd be like all right so what kind of headline are these guys using it's a short headline benefit focus they want to sell more 
What about the descriptive text? It reiterates the pain point and the solution. It's simple, it's two sentences. Um, further down the page, the descriptive text is focused on the end benefit the customer gets. All of these things, and you wanna analyze a couple of these different pages to see what trends are used consistently throughout the industry. Because generally speaking, if something's used by a lot of brands who are making a lot of money, they're all doing it because it works. And you want to add those skills into your skill set. Yeah, and if you think you can write better copy than uh, uh, a company's Pitch. live page is showing, then... Pitch it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Pitch them straight away. Um, cool. So create three samples for your portfolio or around three if you've got nothing and you just need some spec pieces um, to actually show that you can do the job. Yeah, and maybe um, uh, don't write them all in the same style. Uh, yeah. Try to vary it up a bit just yeah. so they can get a feel for what you can do as well or your versatility. Yeah, and that's the thing, you know, you, they might find that one of those samples isn't what they want, but um, yeah. the you know, the other two are very similar to what they want. So Janine's asked, what if my client only wants blog articles? What is the ROI I can present in another proposal for future clients? So for me, blog articles that I've always found when I was head of content, there's only really two things that I wanted from blog pieces was to rank well in Google and for email leads captured because the company did most of their selling through email. Yeah, so uh, if you uh, if your client only wants blog articles, it really depends. Uh, yeah, like Pete said, you should be looking at why they want those blog articles and what else you could uh, pitch them in return. For example, uh, could they benefit from like a uh, content marketing strategy to go with those blog articles? Or are they only looking for blog articles? Are they also looking for ebooks or case studies or white papers? And um, uh, if they only want blog articles, how many do they want? Uh, and you can package them to, and basically, if they, if they like uh, one or two trial articles that you've done for them, uh, maybe you can try to convince them uh, for a package deal. I think we're gonna get into that a bit later, right? When we get to pricing. Yeah, we should, yeah, I mean, we can cover that a little bit more in more detail. But yeah, the ROI basically from blogs it, it, generally it's going to be more exposure, more reach, more traffic and um, yeah. basically securing leads from the top of funnel so that they can continue to market to them through middle and bottom of funnel. So that would usually be an email uh, capture, which as Valeria said, you know, if you do like a case study white paper thing, you can use that as the actual lead magnet. Nathan says he's not a total noob, worked in house all career, didn't have the foresight to take copies of all the stuff done. Most online content is now gone, so need to start a portfolio from scratch. No. <laughs> oh, that sucks, man. Um, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> oh, uh, you can try to look on the um, oh, way, back, way back, way back machine, right? Way back machine, yeah, that might that might work if you know the URLs. Then you could use yeah. way back machine to go back in time, and it will pull up the web page from the period when your copy would have been live. That could be a quick and easy solution. You could try to do that, but uh, if not, you can just uh, also look at um, other stuff you've written. I, uh, when I first started out, I had a bunch of stuff from uh, another company I worked with, and it had almost nothing to do with uh, copywriting. Uh, it was just articles. Yeah. Yeah, cool. So two options, free portfolio. Free portfolio, Google Documents which is very easy to set up, but the problem is you have to drive your own traffic to it. A paid portfolio, like your own website, uh, comes on your own domain, it looks more professional, and there is the potential for organic traffic in the long run. Now, both of these are viable, and it's your decision. Eventually, everybody should really have their own portfolio website thing that you could drive traffic to, because then you can start working on your own blog to show your own uh, skills at blog writing, you could um, work on your sales pages, you could work on your email marketing to see if you can generate leads. Having your own paid portfolio is like your own mess around area that you can just try things out. 
go full page extension lecture copy yeah Nat natalia that's the one that i use actually um go full page for the uh images yeah good domains um by good domains do you mean like domain name because there is something coming up in that um so hold on for the minute because this next session will cover us something about that and if we don't answer the question then just just ask again elena yeah creating a professional online presence so this would be like as a paid approach to um get your portfolio up why do you need the website allow clients to find you uh through search results a centralized portfolio in one place potential to generate passive leads for your business it's a great playground to hone your skills like you can just oh i want to get better at blog writing so i'll just write some blogs i'll put them on my website um it looks more professional enabling higher rates so questions are coming in as well yeah we're going to get to that technical so, setup sorry go on oh yeah oh no just uh was going to say uh, can you go to the previous slide i forgot this one yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, all good. Uh, yeah, so basically, it's much easier to um, when uh, when a prospect comes to you and says, "Hey, um, can you show me some of your work, or can you link me to some of something?" It's always cool to be like, "Hey, here's my um, uh, website URL, and this is my sample URL," rather than, "Hey, uh, yeah, these are some Google Doc." samples uh yeah i don't have a website right now i'll see you later right <laughs> it does it just gives you that professional it's like i get a lot of pictures i get two or three probably every day from people trying to sell me seo services and it's always from somebody at gmail.com and immediately if somebody pitches me a professional service from an at gmail account it's gone it's in the trash it's done yeah yeah um, Same. um so yeah the medium so the, oh yeah, I was reading Natalia's question. I would say yeah, yeah. double post. Yeah. See, that's the thing. Medium is great for that visibility, but you don't own it. Yeah. Um, Olga's raised her hand as well. Um, yeah, but you don't own Medium, and if Medium ever changes the way that they promote, distribute content, anything like that, you're going to suffer. Yeah. There's nothing you can do about it. So publish on your own blog and then republish to Medium, as Valeria yeah. said. And link back, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, technical setup tips for your website. Find a web host, and this is answering uh, what Elaine was saying. Um, it's my favorite, yeah. 24 hour support and high reviews. There's a bunch out there, everybody will tell you that their one's the best, but as long as it has 24 hour support and high reviews, you should be okay and just don't go with wix squarespace weebly or a domain.wordpress.com website i i strongly recommend siteground uh okay after after like a year or two i think the the pricing increases a bit but it's it's got bar none the best support of any hosting service i've ever had Miranda's asked, why stay clear of these web domains? Or these are, so this is not the domain, like Wix, Squarespace, Weebly um, are the hosting companies and also the opera, uh, the CMS, the content management system. Uh, although I've never used Weebly, I know Valerio has. I've, I've actually paid for Wix, Weebly and Bluehost and they're all nightmares. Yeah, <laughs> all of them. Um, because I know I've had clients who have used Wix and Squarespace and in every client I've ever worked with who used Wix and Squarespace for their content side of things, we've always moved it over to a paid WordPress custom oh, yeah. install afterwards because the SEO capabilities are just weak, weak. Yeah. That's not um, good. That, Natalia makes a great point about SiteGround. Namecheap is excellent. I buy my domain names on Namecheap and then host them on SiteGround oh, just sorry. because I paid for SiteGround for like, several years ahead oh henley you dodged a real bullet there oh i, I didn't realize that you couldn't own the pages ah oh, april says That's that terrible. but also nikki's uh joined by something from so i'm reading lots and we'll be trying to create spec pieces for a website which i'm to set up in a couple of months what i worry about is can i really call myself a copywriter when i've only been learning for a couple of months i do feel a fraud imposter syndrome is real and uh you never get over it. Imposter syndrome, every time that you try and step up your career, it will be there. 
um, best skill that you can have is just try and push through imposter syndrome. It's the only advice on that that I can think of. <laughs> okay, so we're marketers. Oh, there's right? Natalia as well. Yeah, sorry, go on. Uh, yeah, yeah, Natalia's like, I feel like a front, like four years in. Yeah, yeah. you know, you're, you're going to have those moments. My, uh, my girlfriend is actually, uh, uh, she's been an agency designer for years and she's designed for Red Bull and all these big brands. And she tells me she feels like a fraud all the time. Uh, it's, it's crazy. I think we all get it. I think if you don't get it, then there's something maybe perhaps. Maybe, maybe you're a psychopath. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's where I was going, but I didn't want to say it. <laughs> um, some good names for hosting. I'm trying to catch up. With you too. Oh, this is being recorded as well, Yelena. So there will be uh, access to the recording. Um, so you said that you get your hosting through SiteGround, right? Yep, SiteGround. And then, it, yeah, and Namecheap, there you go. Namecheap is, uh, like, I buy all my na uh, domain names on Namecheap. And, um, That's good, because I'm buying one tomorrow, so I'll do that. If you, if you want, uh, you should host on WordPress, and if you do, uh, get your hands on Elementor. I'll, I'll type it in the group. It's an excellent builder. Oh, wow. That's right, Jacqueline, yeah. All panelists, yeah. Oh, I love, yeah, excellent. Yeah, I have the pro version. I got a license for like 200 websites, and I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> You've just got to buy have, 200 websites and just yeah, have exactly. your own, what is it, the distribution network so that you can do loads of backlinking to yourself. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, I should do that. <laughs> Oh, DV? I, I used to use DV, but I think it's a bit bloated. It made my site kind of slow. I'm not familiar so, with DV. What's that? It's DV Builder. It's another builder. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Cool. Oh, yeah. Envato was all right, too. Yeah. And Envato as elements, yeah. Valeria said, like, use a template like Elementor or, or something that's easily customizable just to get up and running ASAP because a big theme with seeing progress here is just done is better than perfect. Um, just get it done, get it up and get real life feedback and then adapt and improve as you go along. Just um, do it. Yeah, exactly. What pages does your site need? Keep it simple, done is better than perfect. You need a home page and about you page, a contact page and a services page, a samples page and a blog page. We put optional for blog page. Um, I will see if I can't save the chat comments too. I'm not sure how, but I will figure it out. Um, copy paste. Yeah, copy paste into a Google Doc if I have to. Um, blog page is optional, but eventually you'll want a blog page. These are like the five that you'll need pretty quickly. Um, that's pretty much it for that. Valerio, you got anything to add on the pages? Uh, um uh well yeah the blog page uh add the blog later if you can because you don't necessarily need a live blog to start hitting up clients exactly. it's i i like to i'm working on my uh blog now because i'm going to be uh, ramping up seo and offering it as a service so that's why uh, other than that i probably wouldn't keep a blog unless to showcase my writing yeah yeah no i agree um, done is better than perfect. If you wait until you get everything perfect, you'll never take action. Take action, improve and iterate as you go. Fastest path to success. Um, anyone got Neil's Uber suggest? No. Um, I got, I use uh, SEMrush or SEMrush. I never know how to actually say it. You know, they, they pronounce it differently based on whether they're in the UK or the US. But the US yeah. is SEMrush. Yeah, and in the and, and in yeah, the, the UK, UK SEMrush. SEMrush. Yeah, because I always call it SEMrush, and people are like, "What are you talking about?" Um, but yeah, I've not. I used Uber Suggest. I tried it when it was a completely free tool, and I found the um, yeah the estimates to be way off, completely what, off. What, have you uh, tried Answer the Public? Yeah, a while back, actually, I've not used yeah. it in a while, but yeah, yeah, it, it's quite good. Yeah, it's a good for like a um, get an idea of the questions people are asking. Yeah. Yeah, same with, uh, but yeah, I use uh, different tools. Uh, okay, so seeing results through your marketing plan. Indeed. So this is where, you know, all of this stuff about having a portfolio, about having a website, these are all great, but 
what's really going to make the difference is getting your offer in front of your ideal clients. That's what's going to make a big difference. That's what's going to make you some money. Um, and with a business plan, simplicity is the best course of action. This is the genuine real life, um, real business plan for Tesla in 2006. So this is what was published on their blog and you can still Google Tesla business plan and you'll find this on their blog, build a sports car, use that money to money to build an affordable car, use that money to build an even more affordable car while doing so, uh, provide zero emission electric power, you know, boom, super simple, super, super simple. It's not at all complicated. And I think that's what a lot of people do wrong is they overcomplicate everything. Um, yeah. when really it's just about coming up with something that gives you direction and then committing to it with massive action. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, people also, uh, give up on their main plan too easily. You just kind of yeah. need to stick to it. And this is, um, this, I love this because when I first started, um, uh, doing, a, a bit some, you know, business proposal writing and stuff like that. I used to write these like four to five page proposals. You don't need any of it. You just need like two, three sentences and you're good to go. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know whether the clients like that because sometimes they like the overcomplicated thing, but you know, um, but yeah, it's, it's it, keep it simple. Like figure out what you want to achieve, figure out the best way to do it, simplify it as much as possible. That is really the best course of action. And I'd always recommend everybody look at the very specific, like big actions that they can take that are going to make the biggest impact. Like we said, if you've got your portfolio, don't go back and spend a week amending the way that you refer to like one specific thing. It's not going to make that much of a difference. Yeah. The overall process for landing clients, you generate leads, you qualify those leads, you engage them and you get interested leads on the phone, you close them. That That's it. And uh, by the phone, we don't mean, uh, you know, like real phone. It can be like a Zoom call. Zoom call, yeah. I do everything through Zoom now. I am, yeah. I am a lockdown convert. <laughs> um, yeah. So prospecting or generating leads, the simplest ways to do it. Um, I'll come to you in a second to tell you. Go to where your ideal, ideal clients look for advice with the aim of opening a dialogue and find people who could benefit from your service and create a list. Those are the two different ways. So where are your ideal clients hanging out? Go be there, provide value, chat to them, open that dialogue, or figure out who it is that you want to work with and create a list of people to then reach out to. Um, so I've got a question here specifically for me. <laughs> Do I notice proposal differences between US clients and UK clients? Uh, super assertive, so short style works best for a lot of clients, but scares the British. You guys need some serious flourishes and weak words to kind of sound apologetic. <laughs> Do you know what? If I look through my client history, I've worked with only a handful of British companies. I've worked with far more American companies. Um, I've worked with quite a few like Eastern European and some uh, quite a few in Asia as well. Um, personally, I, I, I pitch my services in a certain way, which is more direct, quite assertive. And if somebody's not willing and they don't resonate with the way that I pitch, they're not going to be a good client for me anyway. So I'm not going to change the way that I pitch to suit them because all that's going to do is create a client freelancer relationship that is not going to be sustainable. Um, my focus is wholly on results. Yeah, I'm, and I'm not here to maintain their feelings. Like I want to get results, and if they can't talk about results in very blunt ways, I don't want to work with them. And you, yeah, what coming back to what he said, you don't want one-off clients either. You're trying to build a long-term relationship, so you don't have to like think about headaches with making money and stuff. Yeah, you want yeah. to keep your best clients. Hundred percent. And if you do work from and you have that synergy between the way that you approach the work, if it is you know being more assertive and short and sharp, um, and they like that, it's going to be much easier to get them onto retainer deals than if you're constantly changing the way that you have to talk about everything. Um, cool. So yeah, generating leads, go to where the clients are hanging out, uh, or just build a list of who it is that you want to help, so that you can reach out to them. 
Yeah, and uh, just just to add, uh, your clients aren't hanging out. Your ideal clients are not hanging out on job boards or Upwork. Thank you. <laughs> Do you know, I've got I've had in the entirety of my career, I had like three jobs from a job board, right when I first started, and they were all terrible. I'll bet. Yeah. Yeah, like I, you mean, know, like I said, the first one, I got five things to write and I got paid for three of them. Um, it's probably my fault, to be honest, but hey. Um, I've never got a client from Upwork. I've never used oh, that's it good. client sourcing, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. Natalia is uh, being uh, smart. Good. Smart, sir. So yeah. When you're looking for leads and who you want to connect with, a um, couple of things that you want to do to qualify the right people. You want to go with decision makers like CMOs, head of content, chief copywriter, VP of marketing. Um, the reason being is I see a lot of people, and this was some advice that I read years ago, and I think it still hangs about, around a bit. It's like they say you want to approach the copywriters within the business because if they're busy, then they'll hire you. That's, they don't yeah. have the authority within the business to hire you. They, they just don't. They have to kick everything up to the chief copywriter or the head of content or the CMO for approval. So you go yeah. direct to the person who makes the decision. And even if they did have hiring power, why would they want to hire another writer who might, yeah, exactly. <laughs> who might make them look bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they did my job better than me at half the cost. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Time to look for another job. <laughs> yeah. Um, of course, so the decision makers in your target market and you want to make sure that you qualify them before reaching out because I know a lot of people send a lot of outreach to people without having qualified them first and then they're like, oh, I didn't get any results. There's a reason. Yeah. Um, so here's a little overview of what you might want to look for. So let's say I'm going for software as a service. I'm going to go down to title on LinkedIn and put like CMO or VP marketing or vice president marketing or whatever. And I'm going to get a list of very, very specific people who are vice president marketing communications, like boom, should be perfect to reach out to. No worries, Katie. I'll, um, I'll let you know about the recording as well. Um, Thank you, Andy. you know, these people are people who are in a position to hire me within my target market. That's, you know, you want to, you don't want to waste time on people that can't do that. Yeah. Um, I would like to add that you should also uh, target content marketing managers. And mm -hmm. yeah. uh, when you review their profiles, some of them will mention that they're in charge of building teams and stuff like that. That's the people you do want to target because if they're yeah. building marketing teams, they hire writers. Yeah. yeah. And that's it really. Whatever, whatever it is that you do, you just want to find a person who has the authority to release budget for your services, basically. Yeah. Um, prospecting, generating leads. So, you know, you might, I publish stuff on LinkedIn pretty much every day. And this is going to where my ideal customers hang out or my ideal clients hang out and then finding out who they are. And I'll write something and I'll share it. And then I'll click on the little hearts, likes, whatever's down here. And it will bring up this list here. And I'll go through and I'll be like, right, are any of these people that decision maker who's in a position to hire me. And if they are, then I'll connect with them and I'll open a dialogue. That's what we mean by going to where they're hanging out to open a dialogue. You just share um, useful content with them to get your name known so that you can do a warm introduction. Yeah, I have a um, SaaS agency owner friend and he gets leads like that because he has a podcast and he posts an episode every day. He says yeah. he gets like one to two leads for every episode he posts. So it's crazy. It's just consistency as well. You know, it helps. We we'll able yeah. to put together lovely graphics images. No, no, absolutely not. Also, James, what you might want to do is just check out Canva as a free yeah. tool. It makes design so easy for non-designers. There we go. Cool. Qualifying leads. I see Angela's asked a question as well, which I will get to shortly. Let me just finish off this uh, section. When you have your list of leads or people are engaging with you, you need to qualify those leads uh, to make sure they're worth your time because there's no point in trying to pitch people who just don't have the money, the authority to, to hire you. Um, so tips on qualifying leads. Use a tool like Snowvio. This is one that you mentioned 
There you go. Yes. Uh, you can use Snowview. You can also use LinkedIn Adept Prospector. Okay. Uh, LinkedIn Adept Prospector is awesome because you basically go on the person's LinkedIn profile, click on the extension, and it'll just pop their email out. Wow. That's useful. Um, yeah. Check their business to see if they're, all, they're already investing in your service. This is a mistake I see so many freelancers make. They'll go to somebody's blog and they'll be like, oh, they've already got a full writing team, so they won't need me. Completely the opposite. If somebody's already investing heavily in a content or a channel or a medium, they need um, as much help with that as they can get. Uh, often they have such high demand for churning out more that they will take help. So you want somebody who's already heavily investing in the service that you offer. To find out if they have the budget, I use you know built with Crunchbase, Angel, or just company revenue records to see if they actually have the money. I'll get onto a couple of those in a minute. Valerio, anything to add on that? Or no, I think uh, I think we're good. Cool. cool. So. Here's an example. So this top image here, this one that goes across the top, that's from Crunchbase. And that's what I tend to use when I was um, working with a lot of SaaS brands. And it will tell me, as you can see here, so these guys got $4 million in funding on September 8th, 2020. I know from experience that when a company gets funding, they are also given like insane goals to hit for growth. So they're often then just uh, throwing money at people who can help them hit those goals. So I know that if somebody gets a large amount of funding, I'm going to hit them up and be like, hey, I can help out. Built with, you can get an idea of one, how serious they are. So this was an e commerce brand and they're using Clavio or Clavio, however you want to pronounce it, which means that they're serious about their email marketing. So if I'm an email marketer, I'm going to reach out to them. I also know that between these tools here, they're probably spending a couple of hundred, if not a couple of thousand dollars per month on marketing services. So they're probably going to want people on board who can help them get the best bang for that book. And if all of that fails, just Google the company and their revenue and see if they're actually profitable. And if they've got big numbers, reach out to them. Uh, so I just pulled Clivio from over here for that. You can also uh, check their, if you have a LinkedIn premium or uh, get the trial account, I think they offer yeah. free trials. You can uh, look at all their funding. Yeah. yeah. Sales Navigator has it all as well, right? Yeah. yeah. Cool. But so you basically want to make sure that the companies that you're reaching out to are already investing in the service that you offer and the, the type of writing or the channel that you specialize in. Because if they're not, it's very difficult to convince them um, to then start doing that. And you also want to ensure that they have the money, um, yeah. who has money and the intent to spend it on the service you offer. Otherwise, it's, it's all wasted effort. Uh, so this, is, this was from Oberlo, Oberlo's blog. Uh, and yeah. it's a recently updated blog. This is, I took this on the 18th of September. It's well-optimized content when you see the whole page. It's like, it's a well-optimized page. It looks nice. It's all, you know, it looks great. And there's been obvious spend to create and improve that content. So they would be a good person to reach out to. A lot of freelancers would be intimidated and say, no, I don't want to do that because they've already got it all sorted. Compare that to these guys who are a competitor, it's a poorly optimized blog. Like it looks awful. It looks like some sort of blog from 1992. Uh, it's not been updated in two years. I mean, that was the last post, right? Latest post 2018. No money or effort being put into this. What are the chances this person is gonna spend large amounts of money to get this up and running and also treat you with the respect that you need as a service provider? It's basically nothing. Yeah, you can also tell they wouldn't know good writing if it smacked them in the face. Yeah. So, and also, um, yeah, uh, what was it that I mentioned last time about this? Uh, right, if you uh, come across a blog that also has uh, self, too many self-promotional posts, that's yeah. another sign that you don't want to work with them. If their blog is basically just press releases. Yeah. We just if, hired uh, a new CMO. <laughs> yeah. That means they're not investing in their content. Yeah. 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 But if you see content that you love reading and you think you could write something similar, hit them up. Just because they do already have writers who write like you do doesn't mean they're not always looking for really good writers. 
Yeah, and it probably means that they'll be more likely to hire you because they need more of that kind and quality of work. Yeah, and they're not always looking for the best. They're looking for reliable people who are fun to work with and have good communication and can meet deadlines. Oh, yeah. I can say, yeah. tell some stories. The worst people to work with are just the ones who just don't turn up on time. Like you give them deadlines. <laughs> and yeah, I told you that story about that guy. We had four pieces to do. What and happened? I, I gave him like three weeks and it was four weeks until the client deadline. So that gave me a week to edit. And those three weeks I was checking in with him. I was like, oh yeah, how's it going? How's it going? He's like, yeah, it's great. You know, I've done the first piece. I'm on the second album. I was like, perfect. Check in with him a week later. He's like two and a half done. I'm nearly there. And then the day before his deadline was due, he's like, nah, I didn't even start them. I was like, mate, I've got to write basically like four pieces. <laughs> did, did I tell you about, <laughs> uh, did I tell you about my designer on my uh, creative team? He just, he went out for coffee and then never came back. Yeah, you did mention that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was the worst. Yeah. yeah. What do you say to old school copywriters, direct sales, who don't think oh, yeah. content is copyrighted whatsoever? So I'm doing far more copy direct response work right now. And they are different, but there is a huge overlap in skills. Like good content uses a lot of the fundamentals from good copywriting, in my opinion. Yeah. And I would say the, uh, to be a really good content writer, you do need a, separate but complementary set of skills yeah and vice versa it's yeah. um and uh any old school copywriter who shits on content writing doesn't know what they're talking about because writing great content is a skill it's it is yeah it's tough but you can it is as Valeria said it's a slightly different skill set but there are a lot of overlapping skills and approaches in there that you know yeah. They benefit one another. And, and guess what? Good content writers make a lot of money. Yeah. 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 Uh, should we uh, answer Angela's question as well? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, while I don't copyright, I do teach or coach English language. Prospective clients may have limited English skills. How do I write copy that's professional enough, but also very simple that they will understand and not be insulted? These are highly educated professionals. I don't want to limit my services by appearing too low level. Um, I wouldn't worry so much. I mean, you can go and be overly complex and overly professional, but then if they don't understand what it is that you're saying, are they ever going to hire you? It, yeah. It also depends on your audience. If you're writing for a B2C audience, you can use more simple language, but if it's a B2B audience, uh, business to business, they are more accustomed to, uh, a bit more technical or formal language, but yeah. they're still humans as well. They, they just, you yeah. know, they, they like having fun and reading good content, right? What yeah. Yeah. I would, you know, I would just be very careful of writing something that you think it has to be that certain level, especially if English is their second language and their English isn't great. I, I would look at, a, I would look at what your competitors are writing. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. See what level they take and see if you can't improve upon it. And also how your audience is speaking as well, because that's a great way to look at how they're talking to each other. Yeah. Often the best way that any sort of hook angle or argument is made is uh, talk to your ideal customers. They'll tell you what they want. Yeah. Voice also. Yeah. Voice of customer research, right? Exactly. Yeah. Ideal Most speech. important thing. Um, going back to this, it's easy to convince someone who's already invested in a channel asset or medium to improve it than to persuade someone the thing they aren't doing and don't value is where their focus should be. Yeah. To sum up that bit, engaging the qualified leads, your goal when somebody engages with you on like LinkedIn or you send a cold outreach email, it's not to be like, hey, how you doing? I'm Pete, hire me. It's not to go straight and hard on that sale because immediately that person is going to go, no, thanks. Um, you want to provide value and open a dialogue and you want to converse with that person and then segue into a conversation on how you can actually help the client. So every time, and you know, you'll hear me refer to it a lot, you know, a sales call and all of this. For me, a sales call is less about actually getting the sale, more about figuring out what their problem is, 
whether I can help. And if I can, saying, look, there's a natural overlap here between what you need and what I do. If you want to do it, it's not about me trying to convince or persuade or manipulate somebody into paying me money. I only want to work with people I can legitimately help. The only way that you can find out that is to open that dialogue and to chat with them. Yeah, and you want to make sure it's for you as well because you want to make sure you 100%. get on the call and you don't end up talking to some asshole you don't want to work with. Yeah. Because uh, that, that'll open up a whole can of worms. You know, I used to have this really complex grading system for clients, like qualification system, and it gave people a score out of 100. Anything over 70, these were perfect clients. Anything 50 to 70 was like, okay, good. 40 to 50, I shouldn't. Below 40, flat no. And it was fine, but generally speaking, gut feeling yep. was the Sorry. one thing that was always right. <laughs> The other yeah. stuff was just complications that weren't necessary. Um, get on yeah, the phone I mean, with someone, you'll know. Yeah, I, you, there are some red flags you'll learn. Like uh, if if someone says, "Oh, I've written some copy before," that's uh, that's a big red flag, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I can write. <laughs> yeah, I can write. Yeah, I've written yeah. some stuff, or I I've worked with many copywriters before, and they just didn't make the cut. Uh, that's a big <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah, that is a big <laughs> one actually. Yeah, I've never worked with somebody in a good way who's mentioned something like that then it's always been a pain <laughs> yeah but yeah so when you're engaging potential leads you just want to talk to them you're just there to talk about whether there is overlap um, and whether you can help that you don't want to work with them oh how to word it with clients that you don't want to work with them okay so i'll tell you a, a real story about a guy that i was introduced to by an old client a couple of months ago um he wanted me to redo basically the sales page and an email funnel on the back end. And I said to him, look, you know, we've got to start with some research and it's going to be like a month of research because I need to get on the phone with people. I need to talk to them. I need to build out all of this as Valeria said, like voice of customer, all of this sort of stuff. And this guy's response was, we don't need to do that. I know my customers. I can just tell it to you in an hour's call. And Did so, you, uh, did you say, okay, if we do that, I'm going to charge you an extra $2,000? <laughs> no, my, my response was, all right, if that's the way that you feel, we have different ideas about this project and you'd be better going with a different writer. Thanks for your time. Goodbye. And that was the end of the call. Oh, you're um, nicer than me, man. I was just like, I don't want to waste my time with this. And I ended the call basically immediately because I knew that this guy was just not going to be a good client for me. Um, because good copy is based on a lot of research. If they're like, you don't need to research. No. Yeah, I, also, uh, if you take payment up front or at least 50% up front, try to see how fast they pay it. Because, <laughs> That's uh, a good point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I wouldn't worry about hurting their feelings or anything like that, Miranda. If they're going to be a bad client for you, you just say, look, this isn't going to work. Goodbye. You yeah, don't owe them anything the, uh, at that point. The whole point of the whole negotiation in my opinion before a proper start date is to figure out whether you can work together whether you can help one another if that's a no just say no yep let's uh move to the next slide yeah uh oh we've also got more questions rolling in uh, oh yeah, so this is a guy who actually reached out and connected with me later on. He tried to pitch me a service, but you know, this is the kind of thing he just struck up a conversation. Uh, you know, he just asked me what I was up to. That was it. We were just chatting. And then he was like, Oh, how are you doing this? And I was like, you know, I'm struggling a bit with this. And he was like, Oh, I can help out. Simple, but it started off as just a convo. If he pitched me immediately, I would never have engaged with him. Yeah. Yeah. I can't stand those pitches. It's, um, I, I get them all the time too. And I'm yeah. like, dude, like, <laughs> can we talk? Yeah. yeah it's, if, it's it, if, if it's a live conference, think, think about if it's a live conference and someone comes up to you to shake your hand and instead of asking you anything about you, they're just <laughs> like, Hey, buy my stuff. You know, yeah. you're going to be like, gross. Who are you? <laughs> I'll make you rich. I'll see you yeah. later. <laughs> buy it now. <laughs> walk buy my, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh dear. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you just strike up a conversation. If there's a natural overlap between services and their needs, then you can segue into like a, is there potential here kind of conversation. Um, but that's basically 
what are you going for? But outreach is a quality and quantity game. 3% of people are ready to buy right now. 50 to 60% of people you reach out to will never do business with you. The colder your outreach, the shorter it should be. And um, we both actually, without having organized this between us, like we both went with like a three email outreach. So you yeah. send an initial email and then two follow-ups. And if nobody's responded after that, you cut them dead. That's, you know, yep. that's it. Um, yeah. If, if somebody if you, turns if, around, sorry. Oh, yeah. go, go, go. oh, I just had uh, one thing to add. Basically, if I really, 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 really am dying to work with them, after three emails, I might look up their um, business address and send them something in the mail, like, like in the post. Mail. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, if I really point. wanted to. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we send, send those three email outreach and you send those three to everybody unless on the first email they say, yeah, let's talk. Then you don't send them follow-ups. If on any of those emails they say, never contact me again, then you cut those guys free. You don't want to work with that. It's like, you don't want to bother them. You don't want to waste your time trying to convince somebody who doesn't want to work with you to work with you. If they don't respond after three emails, again, you don't want to waste any more time. It's just not a good lead. Um, yeah, but, but don't give up after sending one email because the money is in the follow-up. I get most of my client engagements off the second email. That second one, so the first follow-up is where I get most positive responses. Um, nice. Yeah, because yeah, the first email, they're usually too busy to even check it. They might have checked it and uh, forgotten it. Right? That's the thing, and they say like, oh, I should get back to this person. Yeah. But then, you know, work gets in the way and they forget and they get busy it's just yeah. life i, I um, have a, use, a, a mail tracker and okay, uh, yeah, it yeah. tells me how many times they open the um so when they open it like four times in an hour i'll do the follow-up and be like hey yeah. um yeah i see you're very interested in my email <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um the pincers that you use email and social together could be Facebook or LinkedIn, whichever you're most comfortable with, but using two channels just helps you stay top of mind. Um, yeah. You know. Yeah, and if they haven't received your email, they might see your LinkedIn or vice versa. Happens exactly. to me all the time. Yeah. yeah. Um, a deal is never lost until the client says they're never gonna work with you. So I should qualify and you know, clarify this. That doesn't mean that you keep sending email after email after email after email after email until they eventually start paying you. What it means is unless somebody is like, hey, never contact me again, there's a potential. Um, I like to keep contacts warm because a lot of the time you'll have someone that you'll email and they'll be like, look, it seems very interesting, but we've got a full content team at the minute or we've already just hired yeah. two copywriters. So then you say, that's cool. Don't worry about it. Is it cool if I check in with you in three to six months? Yep. And you keep them warm. You just, you know, you see something that might be useful for them, a piece of content, you send it to them. So yep. again, you stay top of mind, not for being annoying, but for being valuable and helpful. And yeah, and just uh, being considerate. You say, hey, I just saw this and I thought it was relevant to what we talked about and I thought you might find it helpful. Yeah. But yeah, keeping them warm until they either say no or they're completely ignoring you. If they say no or they completely ignore you, don't waste right. time, don't bother them. It's bad for you, it's bad for them. There's a million other businesses who exactly. don't want to work with you. Yeah. Um, when you're doing outreach, focus on the process, not the results. So don't think I've got to make this many thousands of dollars this month or I've got to land this many clients. Think you've got to send this many emails or this many messages. And what that will do is eventually you'll understand how many emails on average it takes you to land a client. Like I know that out of every hundred emails I send, I land an average of four clients. So if I need one more client, I just need to send around 25 emails. Yeah. That's much easier to do than to make a thousand dollars. Send 25 emails, much easier. Yeah, and uh, yeah, if you, if you charge enough, then four to six clients is all you need. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. yeah. Next stage of the process is a sales call. Like I said, it's not necessarily sales. It's more about conversing with the person, seeing if there's an overlap. Um, closing deals with a phone call. If you're looking at high ticket deals, like multiple thousands to five figure deals, phone call is really the way to go. I've only ever closed one or two big deals without having to get on the phone. 
Uh, they build more trust. They allow you to converse in real time, adapt your pitch. Um, you can drill down into problem areas to make the client really feel their need for you and to explain exactly what it is that they need. Yeah, but if they, uh, if they don't want to get on the call and they're still willing to pay you, don't try to uh, push no. them to get on the call. They're busy people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the most frictionless path to getting the client is the way you want to go. But usually with high ticket deals, it will involve a sales call. But like Valeria said, if they're just like, no, just get it done, just get it done. <laughs> um, tips on effective phone negotiations. The goal is to sell, but the focus is on discovering a problem and figuring out if you can solve it. If you can't solve their problem, then you shouldn't sell your solution to them because it's going to cause stress for you by not providing results. It's going to piss off the client. It's just bad. Um, you could recommend somebody, you know, to stay in the good books. You could say, I can't help, but this guy over here, he can help. Um, <laughs> so Alex has just asked, I had a sales call with a startup games company. They were interested, brainstormed some ideas. He brainstormed the ideas. Um, now yeah. they're ignoring them. Uh, what's your thoughts on how to handle from here? Oh, First off, I would have charged for the brainstorming session. That way they would know. Yeah. But uh, now that you're here, uh, Pete, how would you handle it? Two different things. Like, I don't know how many follow-ups you've done. I would send two follow-ups to be like, hey, what's the deal with this? What's this? If after that, I'd just move on. You can waste uh, time and you yeah. can become frustrated and agitated thinking about it, or you can just go out and find the next one. Yeah, you could, uh, uh, like with one of the follow-ups, you could say, by the way, I forgot to mention, and then mention um, another, uh, not, not another brainstorming idea, but uh, something with your background that might help position you to produce whatever you've brainstormed better, right? Just get more alignment. Yeah, yeah. But That's, then, yeah. Yeah, if they're still unresponsive, the question you've got to ask yourself is, is your time worth chasing these yeah, people who have already just, ghosted on you once or to spend that time to go out and find somebody else who's not going to be a dick about it? The second option is okay. better there. Um, so um, Hinley asked if gets clients who want to get on phone calls, but then they never schedule it in. It's a way that I found to get people... To, to cut the useless people back who were never going to hire you and to actually get them to turn up because I had a big problem a little while back with people scheduling calls and not turning up from. So I would charge everybody $100 for the call. And if they then became a client, that $100 was knocked off their price. Um, if they didn't, see you later, Olga. If they didn't um, become a client, then that would be a hundred dollars for basically a free consultation or a free a consultation from me. Uh, but basically by adding some form of payment in people then don't want to waste that money. It could even you be a not, nominal fee, like 20 bucks. Yeah. But if you're not uh, comfortable uh, with that, based on where you're at, you could try uh, uh, sending them an SMS reminder. So mm. I know Calendly offers a, uh, uh, a service for SMS reminders one hour before the call and that uh, we use that uh, at the agency and we didn't use Calendly but we did use the SMS reminders an hour before the call and they boosted our call rates by like 20 to 30 percent somewhere around there it was insane so definitely worth it yeah, yeah. cool Oh yeah, when you're on a sales call, you've got two ears and one mouth, use them in that ratio. Um, you're not there to just sell, 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 sell. Let them tell you the problem and if you can help, then you talk about that. Um, sales is not about talking over the client and bombarding them with the benefits and the features and all of this stuff about your service. Sorry, I'm just reading Hindi's asked again. Um, yeah. Next, so it's always about getting them to move to the next step, be that approving a proposal, getting on a phone call, but then they ghost before that. Okay. Uh, might be to do with the funnel then if they're interested, but then they don't even book the call. Like how are you getting them to book the call? Cause that's one of the issues, like the old email tell us back and forth, back and forth. What time works for you? Is it Tuesday at seven? Is it 
What about time differences? Like a Calendly link makes it so much easier because you can just send them a link and book a time that works. Get a sales script and follow it. The general progression of a good sales script on these calls fits the below. You know, you break the ice. You take the lead because um, you're there as a partner, not as a basically a remote employee. Focus on their problem. Ask them questions about the problem so that they can explain it to you. Figure out what they've tried that's not worked because you want to know what the problem is and then you want to kind of figure out why they're experiencing that problem. Identify what they want to achieve. Bring all of that together and you should have an idea of like, right, you're here, you want to be here, you've tried this but it's not worked. And if your service is a potential bridge over that gap that they're seeing, then you can be like, this might work for you, this is something that I help with. It's the basic script to follow, if you like, or the stages that you want to run through. Anything to add? Uh, no, I'm good. Sorry, I was reading Don's question. It's okay. uh, an interesting one. <laughs> well, we'll finish this bit off real quick and then we'll bang on to the old questions. Uh, fear, fear is normal. Uh, picking up the phone seems like a big step and I know a lot of freelancers, particularly writers, don't want to do it, but it is necessary to continually land bigger and better clients. You won't close every deal. Um, and especially those first few calls you do will be a nightmare. But as long as you learn from them and keep getting better, that's, that's, that's okay. Um, two or three calls at the beginning, it feels a little odd to actually sell yourself and the service that you're offering, but you get used to it and then it becomes second nature. Before we finish, obviously, you can get the discount on the programs and we're gonna do the Q&A in a second. Um, so we had to start here, which is Valerio's book all about how to... It's, a, it's an amazing book. Yeah, it's so good. Yeah. I, I just read it. It's great. That's <laughs> Five stars, Oprah Club. That's what we want. Um, and so then if you buy that, there is an option to upgrade the purchase and to get $100 off my Make Them Want You, which is the sales negotiation script and the processes and the funnels that I use there to qualify my clients and basically land bigger and better deals. Um, Get the discounts, this little bit.ly link down here, which I'll drop in chat again quickly, is where you can pick those up if you want to. But if there's any other questions, now is the time to ask them. We've run over on this, but we can answer them yeah. wow. now. Wow, so over, but yeah. Yeah, awesome. I know. Yeah. No worries, thank you, Angela, for coming. Really appreciate it. Oh, that's that warms my ice cold heart. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> some um, so dawn asked about the uh ghost writing some oh. clients prefer to hire you as a ghost writer so the writing has a set specific style of voice previously written by someone else for someone else oh my god yeah so uh this is difficult to do especially when i feel the writing style is very different different meaning flat and not content worthy i would say this is not i don't know if this is going to be very helpful but i would say Enhance it. Try to write in a similar style, but uh, better. Or maybe um, what I do is I hop on a call with the client or I chat with the client and maybe send them some um, samples of improvements and say, is this a direction you might want to explore? Uh, Pete, what do you think? Yeah, it's, um, I've not got too much experience in ghostwriting. Um, I've usually written under my own name or written something where it is under somebody else's name, but they're not worried about the style being uh, within that particular tone of voice, if you know what I mean. So this isn't something that I feel too comfortable saying, oh, this is the correct way to do it. Um, yeah, I, I'm struggling on that one, I'm afraid. Uh, I, I've ghostwritten a little uh, for um, CEOs, but I don't think they were flat. It's just, um, yeah, it really depends on the audience too. But uh, because what might sound, well, you're the writer, right? So ah, it's a tough question. It's tough. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, who are you ghostwriting for? 
And if, if it's directly for the client and you think the client's uh, writing is a bit flat, then you do need to tread a bit more carefully. But if it's someone else, uh, you know, then, then you could get away with, um, I would say offer suggestions and go from there. Yeah. And ask for direction. It's yeah. If they get annoyed with that, then, um, there's, there might be a problem with the Catholic client. Uh, I hope that answer was satisfactory. Uh, Janine asks, do you ever subcontract with other writers? Yes. Yes, I do all the time now, actually, because I'm transitioning. Uh, we're transitioning to an agency, so a full team. So uh, copy and content. So definitely we're subcontracting with writers. Can you use a ghostwritten piece in your portfolio? I would get permission first. I've seen other writers do it, but uh, I don't think ideal clients would like it if they saw it and then they asked themselves, did they publish the sample with written permission? So if you do get written permission, uh, I, I recommend stating that uh, published with permission, right? Yeah. And yeah, it's always there. a good idea to ask for permission, especially when you're, you know, publishing anything that technically belongs to a client. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have oh, a subcontract? So, so yeah, Janine asked as well about the subcontract that you said that yeah. you do. I have in the past, uh, I had a period where I wanted to go down the agency route and I grew that out. Um, had a number of contractors and it was fine. You know, it was great. I, I personally didn't enjoy it. Um, while the revenue numbers were higher, my personal profit was lower. And so I eventually stopped it, but, uh, it's definitely a viable way to grow your business. Definitely a viable way. If you like doing that and if you like the project management side of things, it's uh, it's a good way. I've, I've grown, a, I've, I've grown several teams from scratch at startups and I can say, uh, it is extremely challenging for uh, anyone in charge of content or copy to find great writers and reliable it's writers. It's, yeah. So if you are a decent writer and you think you're reliable and fun to work with, you will not have a problem doing this. Yeah. No, it can work. Um, yeah. But yeah. Uh, I don't see any new questions coming in. So this, this one, uh, last one, landing oh, page is. content audits. Oh, yeah, we definitely didn't want to. Uh, uh, yes, there's uh, pricing advice, some pricing advice in my book, and more in your book. But if you check out the collective blog, there's a pricing guide on there too. And um, thank you for the purchase, uh, Henley. Do you ever provide? It free website landing page content audits. Uh, I charge for them. I charge for them. Yeah. Um, I charge quite a, a bit. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a chap who does free ones. There's a guy called Pedro Cortez and, um, yeah, Pedro Cortez. Yeah. yeah you know, Pedro. Um, so he does really good ones, but he does them for free and he uses them for his own marketing material. So like Valeria said, never do work for free, but do your, um, no worries. See you later. Um, use it for your own spec pieces. So what he would do and what he still does to this day is he records himself breaking down uh, software as a service uh, sales page. Yeah. And then he publishes it on all of his social and uses that as lead generation for himself. Um, yeah. I don't do that now because I just charge for it. Um, I've done one or two free ones, but I never like the free ones. I'm, I'm actually about to start doing that with another uh, copywriter, uh, Kima Meje, do you know her? Yeah, yeah, no, I did a video with her. It got published today, oh, actually. Really? Jimmy, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, she uh, she wants to do these uh, SaaS page breakdowns on oh, nice. LinkedIn. So no, yeah, she's a, she's a hustler, man. She she works. She's great. Oh, she yeah, she uh, she read uh, Start Here and uh, thanked me for uh, uh, multiplying her uh, income. It's, oh, nice. Uh, yeah, it was really. Uh, if anybody was on the fence about buying Start Here, there's your. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, because she's landing projects left and right now. Oh, she's, she's killing it on yeah. LinkedIn. I did a video with her about her LinkedIn marketing strategy. Um, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, she got it. She got it from start here. There you go. 
Perfect. I should have you do a video. Are you going to yeah. go to the source? <laughs> yeah, you know, like a completely unplanned, but oh, was it yeah. unplanned? <laughs> it's good. Everyone's going to be like, oh, that was a planned this is, brief moment. Yeah, acting. <laughs> yeah, we're such good actors. <laughs> I'm not that good of an actor, to be honest. Um, but yeah, no, that was great. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll, yeah. I'll send it Absolutely. over. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, she's legit. Oh, you beat me by half a second. There you go. Oh, yeah. Um, what, what's your typing speed? <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea. Uh, oh, I've never understood when people are like, yeah, I can type this many words. Yeah, no. what's your, what's your typing uh, speed? Are they good words? Are they publishable words? If they're not, they're not that. <laughs> um, no worries. Thank you, yeah. Jacqueline. Um, oh, hopefully actually. it was useful. I'm going to, obviously it's going to take a little while to do the buffering, the rendering of this video, but then I'll make yeah. it available and we'll share it in the, the Facebook group and everything. And um, but yeah, we should probably call quits to this now because I know it's very late where you are. Oh yeah, well uh, let's save the uh, chat comments in our very Google good though. point. Can I save chat? There we go. Oh, chat you can? saved. Show in Finder. Where does it save? It? Oh, it just saves it to my. Oh cool. Yeah, yeah, it just saves it as a text document. Cool. Perfect. Yeah. Chat has been saved. Appreciate all of you guys turning up. Really do and. Uh, any questions you know you can reach out to us in different places um facebook we're both yeah. in the collective group so you can yeah. both get both of us there hit us up on facebook and linkedin we'll uh, we'll see you there yeah see you soon thanks guys for turning up and we'll uh, speak to you soon cheers guys see you here